Uh, we're going to have the kids stay up this morning for our, our time in Philippians. So some of you will remember that a couple weeks ago we introduced the book of Philippians. And when you look at the book of Philippians, it comes from, it was written to people who lived in the town of Philippi. What, did we, what have we learned about the people who lived in Philippi? Would you like to remind me what we learned? Not because I don't remember, but I want to know what you remember of what we learned about the people who lived in Philippi. So give me some answers. What do we know about the people who lived in Philippi? Affluent, Affluent. yes, absolutely. What? Disciplined, yes, they were disciplined. They were all descended from military families. Uh, Anything else? Those are two of the major things, but anything else? They had a gold mine. You know, that, that plays into the affluence, right, quite a bit, you know. Well, <coughs> the, the, the reality is the town of Philippi was, was very similar to many towns and cities across the country here in the United States. Independent, proud, disciplined, ordered, Wealthy. They, they had the right kind of life. And so for the believers in Philippi, a knee-jerk reaction that all of us have as believers, right? If you come to the Lord and you love the Lord, then he'll make your life like he made my life, right? 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 My life of discipline and order and financial independence. After all, is that not God's promise to all of us? That we, would, we, that we would have, because of him, we would have order, discipline, and financial independence, right? All like that. You can go like this. That's okay. It was a joke. All right? I, I was setting you up, hoping you'd catch the joke. Right? No. But is that not how we tend to think of other believers without conscious awareness of this? Like we we think of people like if you love God and you don't have your own house, what's wrong with you? If you love God and you don't have a full-time job that meets all of your financial needs, Why aren't you trying harder? What's wrong with you? If you love God and you struggle with discipline, well, buck up, buddy, and get with it. We make these assumptions without thought. And so also with the Philippian believers, which is why when we get into the book of Philippians, which I like thinking of as the wisdom book in the New Testament. God starts, and we spent time on this last week, but he starts, <coughs> excuse me, by reminding them that first, Paul and Timothy, who led them to Christ, are slaves of Christ. And then, before he gets into any instruction or any encouragement or anything else, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So at the very beginning This is who you are in Christ. You have in Christ. You have God's grace and you have God's peace. That is the starting point. And then he he says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Isn't that beautiful, the partnership in the gospel? What is partnership in the gospel? What do you think it is? What do you think partnership in the gospel is? What? Same beliefs? Okay, sure, that would be part of it, absolutely. What else? What? Of 
working together to build up the assembly of worshipers. Okay, that'd be part of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, taking part of sharing what God said for all and disciple other people. Yeah, discipling other people. Yep. Yep. Right. Caring for the needs of the widows and the orphans. Absolutely. You know, you know, one thing that I'm surprised nobody here mentioned, given our American culture, is financial support of those who are giving the gospel. That's part of partnering with the gospel, isn't it? I would hope so. Otherwise, our missions programs are a giant waste. And so here we have, in the, in the Philippian church, we have people who are, yes, they're, they're actively discipling. Yes, they're building up the church. Yes, they are, they are working with Paul with the same belief in the gospel. Absolutely. They're also supporting Paul as he goes to give the gospel. After all, is that not one of the great benefits of living in an affluent society? where you all have a little bit extra money, well, maybe not all, but most of you have a little bit extra that you could do something with, and so you decide, because you love God, that you give it to the Lord. You give it to those who are partnering with the Lord, going forward with the gospel. You can go like this. It's okay. Yes. You might be thinking to yourself, yeah, but I just only give five bucks when I can. I mean, that's not much. But you're still partnering with the gospel, amen? Right? You're partnering with the gospel. And so Paul has the privilege of being thankful every time he remembers the believers in Philippi. Now, I've got to ask an important question here. Are the believers in Philippi the ideal Christian church. There is no such thing. Thank you. Somebody knew that somebody caught the trick question. There is no ideal Christian church. So they had problems at their church. They were not perfect people. So given the fact that they had problems, that Paul gets to, over the book of Philippians, address some of those problems... It emphasizes the significance of what is most important. You see, the Philippian church was excited about the gospel. They loved the gospel. They were, they were part of making disciples, helping others to make disciples, a.k.a. Paul and Silas, or Paul and Timothy here, excuse me. Right? They, were, they were partnering with Paul in multiple ways for the future, for the benefit of the gospel. And so because of the big picture that they were in agreement and moving forward together, Paul looks at them and he says, every time I think of you, it brings thankfulness to my heart. I re I'm always praying with joy, not heaviness. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Do you pray with joy? Do you have thankful thoughts about people who are partnering in the gospel? Now, if we were in a seminary class, we could put on our seminary hoity-toity hats of how smart we are, and we could discuss, well, what does the gospel mean? And how do we know if someone's actually partnering in the gospel? 
Because in all of our pride and arrogance, we want to have a reason to not support certain people that we don't like. I'm going to say that again in case you weren't listening. In our pride and arrogance, we want to have a reason to not support certain people that we don't like. Now, maybe we were trained not to like them as children. Maybe we learned not to like them as adults. But there are some people that we will see in heaven someday that we just don't like. And we refuse to rejoice that they're passing out the gospel and that we'll see them in heaven. Because after all, well, they just don't, they they don't deserve my my joy in what they're doing. I don't agree. I don't like it. I don't like them. I don't like what they're doing. I'm not going to be joyful. I'm not going to rejoice. I'm not going to give thanks. After all, look at all the problems they've caused. As if to say, I haven't caused any problems in the gospel. No one would ever be offended from the gospel because of me. After all, look at how flawless my life is. I know, you're all sitting there going, ha, 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 that's funny. (laughs) But is that not our attitude about certain people that we don't want to rejoice with? We have no interest in whether or not They're actually giving out the gospel. We're not listening to the words that they say. We've already determined that we don't like them, that they will not bring us joy, and that we will not be joyful when they have good news about the gospel. After all, if someone comes to the Lord through them, it was just luck. I mean, come on, right? Every every once in a while, a blind squirrel finds a nut, obviously, so, you know. And yet here Paul, knowing that the Philippians are not a perfect church, knowing that they have problems that he's going to be addressing, lets them know that because of the gospel, not because of their perfect theology, not because of their excellent church patterns of behavior, not because of how fantastic they are at being great Baptists. I mean, obviously, they were Baptists in Philippi if they're getting praise, clearly, right? Because you only get that if you're Baptist. (laughs) Anyway, um, yeah, not... But because of the gospel, what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. How theologically... uh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. How intellectually appropriate do you need to be to grasp the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ? How old do you have to be to grasp the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not, not very old. How, so how difficult is it for somebody to know and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's not difficult. It's simple. We make it difficult Because we are always right. (laughs) My daughter laughed loudest. (laughs) Because she knows. She knows I'm not always right. But we give thanks because of the gospel. And he says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and the defense and establishment of the gospel. Isn't this beautiful? Why is he confident? I'm sure of this. That he who started a good work of you, good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul's confidence has nothing to do with his teaching. It has nothing to do with his fantastic theology. 
It has nothing to do with how smart he is or how smart or foolish they are. His confidence doesn't rest on the fact that he's writing them a letter to set them straight and get them on the narrow. No, that's not what his confidence is. He's confident because Jesus Christ is the one they are following. He is the same one that Paul is following. And what did Jesus Christ do to change Paul and how much change did he have to bring into Paul? Look at Paul's life. Paul was the guy known as Saul of Tarsus who was against all Christians. He was violent. He was, he was um, motivated. He was uh, ambitious. And he was rising to the top in the Jewish hierarchy of, of importance and he had, he had letters from the chief priests to go and to drag believers out of their homes to force them into quote unquote blasphemy by calling Jesus Lord so that he could stone them and throw them in prison great guy by the way really kind of guy you want to have over for dinner Just be careful what you say How much work did God have to do to make Saul the person who was going to point people who had no interest in the gospel, who had never heard of Christ, to say there is one God, like he said on Mars Hill, right? When he said, you have an altar to the unknown God, I'm here to declare him to you. He's the one who created heaven and earth. And he goes on to explain that this God sent his son to die for our sins. And at that he was mocked. You see, Paul knew all that Christ had done to change him. And so when he looked at the Philippian believers... He, had, he was sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion. So whose responsibility was it for the final development and maturity of the Philippian believers? Was it Paul? Is that why he wrote this letter? Because he was the one responsible that they know all the right answers, that they have all the Sunday school answers for every question they could ever get about the Bible, and that they have that, that their that their logic is ironclad and foolproof because that's the only way. No, he was saying that because of what God had done in his life, because the work of Jesus Christ happening and ongoing in his life that he could look at these believers in whatever state of maturity that they found themselves and say that I'm confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Not because I'm there. Not because I can give you all the answers. Not because you can depend on me. No, but because I'm being changed and molded by the same one who's still at work in me. So I know he's going to carry on his work in you. So as you look to Philippians for encouragement, for wisdom, for instruction, just like you look at it for the rest of Scripture, the work in you is the job of the one who saved you. It's not the job of another preacher. It's not the job of an evangelist. It's not the job of a spiritual mentor. It's not, the, it's not anybody else's responsibility because Christ has taken it on his shoulders. He said that he, he is where the buck stops for your life. He's given you everything you need for life and godliness. And Paul here says that because of what he knows of Christ, that he's confident that that the one who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. 
So when you look to God for wisdom, when you look to God for help, when you look to God because you need the help and you're, you're, you feel like you're just failing all over the place, that you can't find an anchor, that you're about ready to drown in all that you're dealing with, it is the rock of Jesus Christ that is going to carry you on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to finish the good work that he started in you, just like he promised also in Romans when he said, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, who were born not of the will of man, nor of the will of, of the flesh, but of God. You see, God's work in you will continue. He will continue to work. So here's the big question that you need to consider for yourself today. Have you rejected God's work in you? He's at work in you. And at some point, you'll say yes to him. Because if he's your savior... If he's your Lord, if he's your master, at some point you will submit to him. But the question you have to look into your own heart today is, are you currently trying to resist his change? Are you currently saying, no, God, I don't want to listen to that. Anything but that, please. Look what I'm doing over here, God. I can have this little thing, really. It, it makes me feel so good. It's just, it's just because I, I, I love it. No, I love you more, but I love this a lot. And at some point, he's going to win. So why resist the good change that he's trying to create for your good to carry on the completion of his work in your life? It's his work. And like Paul said, he's confident that God will accomplish his work. So he's not worried but if you're resisting, you're the one who's losing today. God will win. He will accomplish his purpose. Of this, we can have great, great confidence. So if you let God win when you know what he wants, his purpose will be accomplished. You will see more of his good sooner, and you'll have greater peace in your inner man. But I'm glad we can say it with Paul that for those of us who are, as best as we know, submitting to the work of the Spirit, that we can say as we look around that I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion. I'm not worried that God's going to fail in his work. I'm not worried that God's word is going to fail. I'm not worried that you'll somehow miss the whole point of salvation because you cannot indefinitely ignore the work of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So submit to him this morning if you haven't been and you'll find the joy and rejoicing that his spirit brings because he's going to win anyway. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the power of your truth. Thank you for the joy we have to look at your truth. And Lord, thank you that, that we have such confidence in your work. Lord, you have already won the battle. Lord, the, the, your, the victory is yours. And I ask that you would give us the strength and the humility that we each need Lord, that when you call on us to change, that we submit to the work of your spirit. And do not keep fighting you, thinking that somehow our way is better. <laughs>